With all of the other new models Chrysler has introduced in recent years, it was only a matter of time before it decided to produce a new convertible. Introducing the Sebring JX and JXI, the newest additions to the Chrysler lineup. The Sebring convertible is based on the Cirrus Stratus platform, and in many ways these models are similar. However, there are important differences that go beyond the obvious one of the top and the switch from four to two doors. In this Master Tech program, we'll be covering the similarities and differences with an emphasis on the retractor integrated height adjusters used for the front seat belts, body components such as door glass, and of course, the top itself. Let's get started with a look at powertrains. The Sebring convertibles use the same 2.4 liter four-cylinder and 2.5 liter V6 engines used on Cirrus and Stratus. The dual overhead cam 2.4 liter engine is based on the Neon 2 liter and was described in the January 1995 MasterTech program. The single overhead cam 2.5 liter engine is based on the Mitsubishi 3 liter V6 and was described in the December 1994 MasterTech. For 1996, the 2.5-liter engine uses a new compact starter motor. An interesting difference between the Sebring convertible and the Cirrus and Stratus is the engine mounts. Although all of these vehicles use the new four-point mounting system, the mounts on Sebring are tuned differently because of the different body structure. A more obvious difference is in front of the engine at the cooling module. The Sebring uses a single fan cooling module instead of the dual fan on Cirrus and Stratus. Like other 1996 models, the Sebring convertible complies with OBD2 requirements for diagnosing emissions and related items. The new convertible also features a leak detection pump and solenoid for checking the evaporative emission system. The PCM seals the evaporative system and pumps air into it. By monitoring the pump shutoff point, the PCM determines whether the system has a leak. By the way, the PCM is the third generation electronic control module, also known as SBEC-3. Among the differences between the previous modules and this one is the way fuel delivery is controlled. The SBEC-3 uses the oxygen readings from the downstream oxygen sensor to fine-tune the air-fuel ratio. It does this by adjusting the rich lean switch point connected with the upstream O2 sensor. Since the Sebring is shorter than the Cirrus and Stratus, the exhaust system is different. It's also different at the muffler inlet. In short, parts are not interchangeable. The Sebring uses the same electronically controlled four-speed automatic transaxle as Cirrus and Stratus, the 41TE. The 41TE, used in 2.4 and 2.5 liter applications, has undergone some hardware improvements for 1996, including the use of a transmission range sensor, which replaces the park neutral and manual valve lever position switches. Like other 1996 models, Sebring uses the third generation transmission control module, also known as ETAX-3. An important difference between this and previous TCMs is that ETEX-3 incorporates OBD2 diagnostic requirements. The TCM can now request that the PCM illuminate the malfunction indicator lamp because some transmission malfunctions are now considered to be emission related. The new TCM also provides interactive speed control. The operation of this feature was described in an article in the July Tech News. It's a good idea to get to know how this system works. Some customers may not be familiar with the feature's operating characteristics and may mistake normal operation for a transmission concern. Next, we're going to look at suspension, steering, and brakes. But first, try this review question. The purpose of the leak detection pump on Sebring's evaporative system is to A, evacuate the system, B, pressurize the system, or C, maintain atmospheric pressure. The answer is B, to pressurize the system. 
The PCM monitors the pump for shutoff at a certain point to check for leaks. The Sebring's front suspension uses the same short long arm, or SLA design, as the Cirrus and Stratus. Although the suspension may be tuned differently with the use of different rubber isolators. You may recall that the SLA suspension consists of a short upper control arm connected to the upper end of a long curved steering knuckle. A longer lower control arm connected to the bottom of the steering knuckle has transverse and trailing legs. The lower end of the shock absorber is connected to the transverse leg of the lower control arm. The rear suspension is also similar to that on Cirrus and Stratus. Like the front, it uses an upper control arm connected to the top of a knuckle arm. At the bottom, however, the rear suspension uses lateral lengths and a trailing arm to control wheel and tire movement. The shock absorber connects to the body at the top and to the knuckle at the bottom. For further information on servicing this suspension, see the June 1994 MasterTech release on the Cirrus and Stratus. The Sebring convertible uses speed-sensitive power steering that is mechanically controlled. This is similar to the system on Talon and Sebring Avenger. The pump flow control system senses engine speed, providing high assist for easy parking and low speed driving, and low assist for a firm, responsive feel at highway speeds. In addition to speed-sensitive steering, the Sebring JXI has a firm feel steering gear and 16-inch tires, along with a touring suspension that is tuned differently than the JX's. Sebring convertibles use front disc, rear drum brakes. The rear Kelsey Hayes drum brakes feature a drum diameter of 220 millimeters. An anti-lock brake system is standard equipment the system is a version of the Bendix ABX4, which you may remember from our programs on Neon. Next, we're going to look at some restraint system features, including a front seat belt system that you probably haven't seen before. The Sebring uses a driver and front seat passenger airbag system, similar to that on the Cirrus and Stratus. The airbag control module is located under the floor console and contains the system's single impact detection sensor. While the airbag system is similar to that on Cirrus and Stratus, the front seat belts are not. If you look closely at the front seat on a Sebring, you'll notice that the seat belt emerges from the top of the seat instead of from the car's B pillar. That's because the seat belt retractor is part of the seat back. The retractor spool is designed to automatically adjust for height by shifting the point at which the belt unwinds. Hence the name, Retractor Integrated Height Adjuster Seat Belt. In addition to their other differences, the seat belts are also electronically controlled. When frontal impact occurs, the seat belt control module uses a signal from a G sensor to interrupt power to a solenoid in the retractor, which locks the webbing in place. The control module and G sensor are located under the floor console. The electronic control includes a timeout feature you'll need to keep in mind when explaining system operation or when working on the system. After the ignition is turned off, the system times out to prevent ignition off draw. Timeout occurs after 30 minutes if no doors have been opened. After the timeout, you cannot extract seat belt webbing from the retractor unless you open a door or turn the ignition on. The inboard seat belt buckle is also attached to the seat, making the entire seat belt system part of the seat assembly. The rear seat belts are the three-point active type with the retractor located in a seat belt tower behind the seat. Now that we've covered restraint systems, check your knowledge of the Sebring Convertible's front seat belts with this review question. Which of the following is not part of the Sebring Convertible's front seat belt system? A, height adjustable turning loop. B, control module. Or C, G sensor. The answer is A, height adjustable turning loop. The retractor integrated height adjustable seat belt adjusts for height by means of the retractor.
If you are familiar with the electrical system used on the Cirrus and Stratus, you are probably familiar with most of Sebring Convertible's electrical features. As on Cirrus and Stratus, the battery is located behind a splash shield in front of the left front wheel well. The wheels must be turned all the way to the left to remove the battery. Jumper cable connections are located in the engine compartment, as is the power distribution center, powertrain control module, transmission control module, and anti-lock brake control module. And if you need to test the charging system, keep in mind that the Sebring convertible uses a new generator rated at 120 amps. Inside the Sebring, at the left end of the instrument panel, is a junction block which includes the fuse block, which is accessible by removing a cover on the end of the instrument panel. The body control module is attached to the junction block. As on Cirrus and Stratus, the BCM controls almost all of the body electrical features, including remote keyless entry and vehicle theft alarm. Remote keyless entry with illuminated entry and panic alarm is standard equipment on Sebring JXI and optional on Sebring JX. Vehicle theft alarm is optional on both vehicles. As on Cirrus and Stratus and the 1996 minivan, the remote keyless entry system is programmed using the DRB3. A remote keyless entry system of a different kind is a new feature on the Sebring convertible and on other 1996 models. I'm referring to the optional Homelink Universal Transmitter, which is built into the driver's side sun visor. It's standard equipment on Sebring JXI and optional on JX. The transmitter can be programmed to work with nearly all garage door openers and can be used for other functions as well, such as turning on lights or opening a security gate. Next month's MasterTech New Model Highlights contains more information about the Universal Transmitter System, including programming, so be sure to watch. Like the Cirrus and Stratus, the Sebring's instrument cluster uses a vacuum fluorescent display that includes a diagnostic mode. To initiate self-diagnostics, depress the trip reset button while turning the ignition key on. Air conditioning is standard equipment on Sebring. A push button in the middle of the fan knob turns the AC on and off. A push button in the middle of the mode control knob operates the rear window defroster, as well as the power heated outside mirrors, which are standard equipment on Sebring JXI and optional on JX. One difference you may notice between the Cirrus and Stratus and the Sebring convertible is the speed control switches. Cirrus and Stratus use four switches, while Sebring uses five, similar to Neon. On Sebring Convertible, the left-hand speed control switches are off and on, while the right-hand switches include Resume Excel, Cancel, and Set Coast. The horn is operated with the membrane switch in the center of the steering wheel. Four radios are available on Sebring. These AM-FM stereos include one with a cassette player, the RAL, one with a premium cassette and CD changer controls, the RBS, one with a CD player, the RBR, and one with a premium cassette and CD player, the RAZ. A trunk-mounted CD changer, the RDR, is available on vehicles equipped with the cassette player and CD changer controls. The radios with Infinity controls include several features which can save time during service. One feature stores station presets in non-volatile memory so you don't need to reprogram stations after a battery disconnect. Also, on Infinity radios, you can diagnose sound system trouble using the DRB3 or the MDS. Now check your knowledge of the Sebring Convertible's electrical system with this review question. Where is the battery located in Sebring Convertible? A. Left side of the engine compartment. B. In front of the left front wheel well. Or C in the trunk on the left side? The answer is B. As on Cirrus and Stratus, the Sebring's battery is located in front of the left front wheel well behind a splash shield. In developing the Sebring, Chrysler engineers placed a lot of emphasis on making sure the body was rigid enough to meet the demands of a convertible design. 
They accomplished this in several ways. The Sebring convertible's underbody features a straight-through rail design with frame rails running from the front of the car to the rear. The crosscar pieces between the rails give the underbody a ladder configuration, which contributes to the body's stiffness. Also contributing to the Sebring's stiffness are reinforced sills and seat reinforcements, including a crosscar structure in the rear. The aluminum front and rear bumper supports also function as crosscar beams, as does a tubular rear reinforcement structure between the B pillars. As on Cirrus and Stratus, there is a cross car beam that serves as the main support for the instrument panel, and that contributes to torsional rigidity. Add to these features B pillar and quarter panel reinforcements, and you have a design that is not only rigid, but that also contributes to dynamic side impact protection. To ensure body integrity, all metal is galvanized and E coated. Customers wouldn't have to worry about the hood corroding anyway. It's made of sheet molded compound. This material is also resistant to dents. If you encounter a customer with radio interference, only with the engine running, be sure to check for the presence of the hood silencer pad. Aluminum foil has been integrated into it to suppress radio interference. The deck lid is also made of sheet molded compound. And you'll notice that gas filled prop rods are used unlike the Cirrus and Stratus coil spring system. Earlier, we talked about the front seat belt system. Because of its design, seat and seat belt assemblies can be removed from the Sebring convertible as a unit. You do need to be aware of a few things when servicing power and manual front seats. If you need to remove the lower seat belt anchor, keep in mind that the nut is not reusable. You must use a new nut when reinstalling the anchor. Another item you need to be aware of involves manual seat installation. Be sure to use the procedure in the service manual to position the seat tracks in their full rearward position prior to installation. Sebring convertible doors share some features with those used on Cirrus and Stratus. For example, door trim clips are designed to be reused, and the door beam helps provide dynamic side impact protection. For the most part, however, the doors used on the Sebring convertible are specifically designed for a convertible application. For example, notice the belt area reinforcements that lend rigidity to the door inner panel. When making adjustments to the Sebring, keep in mind that the door must be adjusted to the body before you proceed to glass adjustments. Speaking of door glass, for its power front windows, Sebring Convertible uses a scissor type regulator similar to that on Neon 2 door. The Sebring door glass is adjustable up and down, fore and aft, and in and out. The rear quarter glass must be lowered for a door glass adjustment. The door glass on Sebring is adjusted to a specified distance from the convertible top weather strip retainers. So weather strips must be removed prior to making adjustments. The weather strips do not use an adhesive and can be reinstalled in the retainers. You can adjust glass height by changing the position of the forward and rear upstops. You may also need to adjust the forward upstop contact bolt so that the upstop fully contacts the hook on the glass. You should adjust the glass fore and aft at the same time you adjust height. To do this, loosen the two attachment bolts at the rear of the glass. You can use the in and out jack screws to adjust the top of the window inboard and outboard. Turning the jack screws in tilts the top of the window out and vice versa. Once again, keep in mind that the glass is adjusted relative to the weather strip retainers. Be sure to see the table in the service manual for the proper dimensions. The service manual also contains a verification procedure for checking alignment. Depending on the results of the verification, you may need to adjust the rear quarter glass. The power rear quarter window uses a drum and cable type regulator. Before adjusting the rear quarter window, make sure the door glass has been adjusted properly and remove the center and rear side rail weather strips. You'll need to remove the quarter trim panel to access the adjustments. Like the door glass, the rear quarter glass is adjustable up and down in and out and fore and aft. 
To adjust the glass up or down, loosen the upstop nuts and move the upstops up or down. To adjust the glass in or out, loosen the jack screw jam nuts and turn the jack screws in or out. To adjust the glass fore and aft, loosen the glass attachment bolts and move the glass forward or rearward. Be sure to tighten the fasteners and jam nuts after you're done and perform the quarter glass alignment verification. Like the door and rear quarter glass, the windshield plays a crucial role in convertible top sealing. The windshield header and A-pillars use a one-piece weather strip held in place by header and A-pillar retainers. When troubleshooting header A-pillar sealing, pay particular attention to the butyl patch at each corner of the windshield. These patches are critical in water management and must be replaced if worn or damaged. Next, we're going to look at Sebring's convertible top. But first, try this review question about door glass adjustment. The adjuster shown here is used to change the position of the Sebring's door glass, A, up and down, B, in and out, or C, fore and aft. The answer is A, up and down. This front upstop, along with the rear, is used to adjust glass height. If you have worked on the convertible top used on LeBaron, the Sebring top should look familiar to you. Both tops are similar in design. A white vinyl top is standard on Sebring JX. A cloth top, standard on Sebring JXI, is available in camel or black. The top bows, rails, and weather strip retainers are made of aluminum, and the tops feature a full cloth headliner. The Sebring convertible top uses three weather strips on the rear, center, and front side rails. These weather strips are held in place by the retainers, which allow some movement fore and aft. As mentioned previously, they do not use an adhesive. One difference you'll notice between the Sebring and LeBaron convertibles is that the Sebring top does not use a header weather strip. The weather strip on the windshield header continues down around the side of the windshield to form the A-pillar seals. We mentioned the heated glass rear window when we covered the electrical system. Other top components include the hydraulic cylinders and lines and pump and reservoir. The hydraulic system uses automatic transmission fluid. A low fluid level will cause noisy or slow operation. To check the fluid with the top up and latched, remove the reservoir fill plug and check the fluid level. If it's low, be sure to check for leaks in the system after refilling the reservoir. The hydraulic pump is powered by an electric motor. Dual relays near the motor control the direction of motor rotation. The relay's coils are powered by the power top switch located in the floor console. The ignition must be on. And of course, before lowering the top, it must be unlatched from the windshield. As on LeBaron, you need to close the latch handles before lowering the top into the storage area or damage to the top could occur. The convertible top adjustments on Sebring are similar to those used previously on the LeBaron convertible. If dowel pins are not positioned properly, they could cause top to windshield misalignment. To adjust them, loosen the pins, position them to center in the retainer holes, and tighten them. Latch hook adjustment affects latching effort and sealing. To adjust the latch, loosen the latch set screw and turn the latch in or out to increase or decrease latching effort. The front to center rail adjustment affects the weather strip pressure on the door and quarter glass. To gain access to the adjuster, lower the top halfway. To decrease the pressure of the seals on the glass, turn the adjusters inward. To increase pressure, turn them outward. The top frame cam and tensioner link adjustment can be used to center the top on the windshield. Adjusting the cam changes the angle between the rear and center rails and as a result moves the top header to the front or to the rear. And adjusting the cams an unequal amount will roll the top to the left or to the right. Place the top in the half down position to access the cams. 
Then loosen the cam set screw and tap the cam to loosen any paint bond. Turning the dart towards the front of the car moves the header towards the front. Moving it towards the rear moves the header to the rear. Moving one adjuster back and the other forward will roll the top in the direction of the cam with the rearmost adjustment. Once the cams are adjusted, you'll need to adjust the tension on the top by allowing the tensioner links to shift in position. To do this, move the headliner to gain access to the tensioner link adjusters. Then, with the top up and latched, loosen the tensioner link bolts enough to allow link movement. Next, push upward in the area of the tensioner link. Take care not to place your arms or hands where they can be injured by moving parts. Once the tensioner link has repositioned itself, tighten the bolts while holding the rails in position. As you can see, the top adjustments are the same ones you've used in the past to adjust the LeBaron top. Now try answering this review question. Which of the following adjustments is used to change the pressure of the top seals on door and quarter glass? A. Dowel pins. B. Latch hooks. Or C. Front to center rails. The answer is C. Front to center rails. The adjustment is made by turning a cam between the rails. That's about it for this look at the Sebring Convertible, a car that builds on the success of both the LeBaron and the Cirrus and Stratus. Be sure to watch next month's Master Tech new model highlights for more information about such features as the Homelink Universal Transmitter. We'll see you next month.